Today our topic is MIDI, which I think was actually mentioned recently. So we are getting to MIDI today. We're going to talk about connecting to MIDI devices, hardware and software, uh, starting with getting MIDI data into Super Collider and using it to make sound. And then depending on how much time we have, we'll talk about getting MIDI out of Super Collider to make sound elsewhere. So generating the MIDI data in Super Collider and sending it somewhere else. So uh, we have um, a very simple patch here, which we'll get to probably not too long from now. We boot the server. Uh, this is a synth def that creates um, a cluster of four detuned sawtooth waves that get mixed uh, down to stereo using splay. That stereo signal is then passed through a resonant low pass filter and we apply a, a generic ADSR envelope, an overall amplitude control, and we send it out. And it sounds like this. Right. Nothing too fancy. Uh, so to uh, get started with MIDI in Super Collider, there are a few uh, minor cross operating system discrepancies, but nothing too huge. Um, Basically, you want to make sure that whatever devices you want to connect are connected and powered on probably before you launch Super Collider. I'm not sure that Super Collider will become aware of new devices if you plug them in after Super Collider has launched. So uh, right now, my computer has two USB ports. I'm using one for my audio interface and one for this M-Audio USB controller. If I had a third, I would plug in a camera so that the controller actually shows up on the video. So I know this makes for a suboptimal video, but you'll just have to use your imagination that right here in front of me, I've got this controller, keys, knobs, faders, just kind of generic USB MIDI controller. So um, the, the first step is to initialize the MIDI client, which is the class in Super Collider that just connects with your computer's MIDI functionality. And that is MIDI client dot init. And when you run this, you should see something happen in the post window to indicate available MIDI uh, source, sources and destinations, places you can send MIDI to, uh, places you can receive MIDI from. Uh, to get MIDI data into Super Collider from one of these sources, you uh, are going to be using the MIDI in class. And there are a couple of different options here. You can use connect and then provide the port and device name or ID or something like that. Uh, I, I find this a little bit, uh, it's, it's not, a, not a huge deal, but usually what works for me is just MIDI in .connect all. And this says, uh, this, this, has, uh, this tells Super Collider to uh, basically virtually connect itself to all of your MIDI data sources, which uh, in this case, I have, I have two sources what's called the IAC or Inter-Application Communication Driver, which is a virtual MIDI device that lives on Mac OS. It's a way to send MIDI from one software to another piece of software running on the same computer. Uh, and then it also sees the Oxygen 49, which is this M-Audio controller that I have. So I'm just gonna connect uh, both of these devices. So when I run this, nothing special happens, but this is a necessary step. Uh, now, I'm pretty sure, 90-something percent sure, that if you just run this line, MIDI in .connect all, that implicitly initializes the MIDI client. And this might be platform-specific, I'm not sure, but if you want to be extra sure that you've connected to things, run this, and then run this, and you should be good to go. And if you're just getting started tinkering around with MIDI, the first thing I like to do is go into what I call debug mode, uh, where we say MIDI funk dot trace, and provide for an argument for the trace method true. And this puts uh, the language in a state where it will print in the post window every single MIDI message that arrives. So if I just mash a bunch of keys, we see just data flowing in, right? Like we've opened a gigantic spigot. And, uh, but let's, let's be a little bit more methodical. I'll play middle C. Uh, that's actually not middle C. Let's go up an octave. There we go, note number 60. And what we see here is it's a note on message. This device has a source identifying number, which is that big long number you see there. Uh, it's on channel zero, which is accurate from a computer's perspective, but to us humans, this is a MIDI message on channel one, zero through 15 versus one through 16. No need to worry about that too much. Note number 60 and the velocity is 108. I can release the note and we get a note off message 
with the same note number and its release velocity. So I'm gonna move one of these faders up and down. We can see that it's got controller number 21 and it's sending values from zero to 127. You can see it's a control change message. It's the type of this message. Uh, here's pitch bend. So we're getting MIDI channel, the pitch bend value. Uh, and this is just a great way to confirm that your device is connected, functioning, and you know, sending data to Super Collider. And it's also a good way to, to figure out, okay, what kind of messages does this button actually send, right? These pads here, these drum pads send note on and note off messages. So anyway, uh, once you are satisfied, you can set this to false, and then it's no longer printing everything. So it's, that is, you know, I, I colloquially call this debug mode. It's, all you're doing is just printing all the data or not printing all the data. All right, so let's now actually receive some MIDI data and do something with it. Instead of just printing every day, we're going to be a little bit more selective. So the class we use to create an object that receives MIDI data and performs an action in response is uh, MIDI def. And you might start to notice a pattern here with the way classes are named. Um, there's a synth def, for example. And all of these def type or def style classes have a sort of consistent syntax where every one of these def objects has a symbol name associated with it. You know, like the synth def up here, it has this name called saw, which means we can uh, sort of replace the, you know, the, we can change this and, and reevaluate it. And the old version called saw is overwritten and the new one replaces it. Kind of the same thing with MIDI def. Uh, but I, let's just learn by doing here. So when we make a MIDI def, we want to first use a creation method that tells it what type of messages we're going to be expecting. So let's just do note on. So we're going to say a MIDI def dot note on. This creates a, a new MIDI def object and we give it a unique symbol name. I'm just going to use on. And then we provide a function. And we'll come back to this in just a second, but I think now might be a good time to open up the help file for MIDI def. Now we can make a MIDI def dot new, but that's usually not what we do. It's a little bit more convenient to use one of these creation methods, MIDI def dot cc for control change, note on messages, note off messages, polyphonic aftertouch, channel aftertouch, pitch bend, etc. And so the, the core of these classes is, uh, is this function. This is a function which the contents of which is evaluated when a MIDI message with the expected type arrives. And we get to pass a few arguments into this function because uh, pretty obviously we want to use the data associated with that MIDI message in order to influence the behavior of the function, right? If we, if we play middle C, we need to sort of incorporate that note number into the function to play the correct pitch using a synth, right? We can't just ignore it. We have to use it somehow. So uh, I think that the, what, the information we need here is right here. When the function is evaluated for note on, note off, control change, and poly touch messages, there are four arguments that we can declare. Uh, they can be, here they're named val, num, chan, source, but you can name them whatever you want, but they will be expected in that order. And a few other MIDI messages, the um, yeah, uh, channel aftertouch, program change, and pitch bend, those only expect three arguments. So slight difference just because of the nuances of the um, MIDI uh, protocol, but we'll just say, we're going to declare these arguments, and just for clarity, we will post them. Post an array of these values. And we're going to run this. So now we've created a MIDI def. It's listening for note on messages, and when one arrives, it will just print these four pieces of data. So here's middle C on the controller. Right? And we release it, nothing happens, because nothing's listening for note off messages only note on messages. So we'd have to make a separate one that does something different for note off. In practice, I rarely find myself needing to use channel and source. Now there's no harm in declaring them here, 
just kind of a good idea, just in case. But of course, there's no reason we have to print them. We could just delete this information. And because this is a def type object, we can just reevaluate it and it's overwritten. We haven't, for example, created a duplicate redundant copy or anything like that. So I'm just pressing middle C a bunch of different times and we're just getting a different velocity value. I mean, press it really hard, we get 127. Really soft, we get low velocity values. Can't seem to get below five. No, nope, it's as low as it goes, okay. All right, um, a little bit more about MIDI defs. You might find various situations where you might want to turn one of them off, just say stop listening for a while. And to do that, we can refer to them by key. We don't need note on anymore. We can just say this MIDI def, the one named on, disable, right? Disable it. Now I can press these keys and nothing happens. And we can enable, and there it is again. This is pretty handy for various reasons. Uh, you don't want to destroy the MIDI def, you just want to inactivate. Uh, if we do want to destroy, uh, free is the message we use, just like a synth. We say, so now press the keys and it's, it's gone, right? We've, we've destroyed this MIDI def. And if you happen to have lots of MIDI defs uh, and you don't want to free them all individually, you can talk to the class and say free all. And this will free every MIDI def. And one last thing here, if we make this again, uh, it's okay, so it's, it's alive, it's, it's uh, doing its job, listening and performing its action. If I press command period, which I'm gonna do right now, that by default destroys MIDI defs. But if you remember tempo clock, uh, we can make a tempo clock permanent by setting its permanent attribute to be true. We can do the same thing with MIDI defs. So we'll uh, just append a uh, setting the permanent flag to true. And now we create this, it's alive. And now if I press command period, it's still there. And this is context dependent. There are some situations when you want your MIDI defs to be permanent because you're gonna be pressing command period a lot and you don't wanna to have to remake them every time. That's a good example of when permanent makes a lot of sense. But there are other times when you want command period to kind of wipe everything clean, including MIDI defs. And so you have this option, basically. And so now the only way to get rid of it is to actually free it. Any questions so far? Let's jump right into it and make a polyphonic synthesizer using this synth def and this keyboard. I want to be able to just press a note, we get a sound. Uh, release a note, it goes away. Now I have demonstrated this multiple times on my YouTube channel. I have a tutorial, it's, I think it's number nine, which is just basically this kind of thing, just polyphonic synthesizer. So uh, if you like, you can even just jump over to that video at some point and, and watch that because that's kind of a more structured tutorial. And I've given this lecture at least two or three times in past semesters. Um, so instead of kind of uh, doing it in a really detailed way, I'm just gonna jump into polyphony. Uh, so the, the, there are 128 different note numbers. Um, theoretically, I, I guess you could have a MIDI controller which has 128 keys. Um, that'd be pretty, pretty unusual. They don't usually go past 88. Um, but that's the theoretical maximum number of synths. That, you know, 128 voice polyphony. Anything higher than that it doesn't really make any sense because that's the maximum number of notes that exist in MIDI. Uh, and uh, so the, the wrong way to do it is to like uh, do, do something really messy in here, like, you know, uh, and because then, you know, just by, by naming a synth X or some throwaway variable, if you press and hold down a key and then press and hold down another key, you're going to make another synth also stored in X. The first one is still alive, but not accessible through the variable X anymore. And so we can't talk to it and it's going to become a stuck note and it just becomes really messy really quickly. So the way that I've learned and the way that makes sense to me is to handle polyphony is to create an array of size 128. And when you play a note, create a synth and store it in that array at the index equal to its note number, because it's impossible to press a key 
and then press it again without first releasing it. So there's, there's really every, every note has its own private storage box where it lives when it comes into existence, right? We, middle C with note number 60 goes in index 60. C sharp goes 61 and, and so on and so forth. So that, uh, let's, let's uh, make some space for ourselves. And we're going to start by making an empty array. Uh, and the easiest way to do this is to say, I don't know, nil exclam 128, right? Just a, an array of uh, size 128, and it's just empty, filled with uh, non-existent things named nil. And then we're going to make two MIDI defs, a note on and a note off. So both of these MIDI defs accept the same four arguments. Just as a reminder, just to reinforce, the, you know, these names, there's nothing special about these names, just like there's nothing special about sig and env. They're just names that are short but meaningful. But the order of declaration here is always going to be the same. So whatever you name your first argument, it's always going to be, in this case, note velocity. The next one's always going to be note number. You can call them A, B, C, D. It doesn't really matter, but, but the order is is fixed. The order is expected exactly like this. So when we get a note on message, what we want to do is make a synth, but uh, put it in the array. We give it the index and the thing to put there. There's lots of different syntax variations on this, but I, this looks nice because we're saying put in the array. Uh, so the index is the note number. Right? It's got 128 slots, and we're going to play middle C. That's number 60. It's going to go in index 60, and it's going to be this synth. And we could just we we could even uh, stop here for a second. Uh, you know, let's, let's just be uh, a little uh, <laughs> you know fast and loose here. So we'll just we'll just make a synth, right? It's a good place to start. And over here, when we get a note off message, we want to say the item at the index corresponding to the note number set its gate to zero. Right? The only way we're going to get a note off is if we've first given a note on and created a synth. And releasing that key is going to say, hey, you, at index note number, your gate is now zero. It fades out and disappears. And we're not done, but let's just see what happens here. So we're going to run this and play a note. And that's good. Let's do another note. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter what key I press, they're all the same because that's exactly what we've told this MIDI def to do. Just play a synth. Use all the default arguments. So we don't want that, right? So what do we do? We provide an argument list. So we have a frequency argument. It's defaulting to 440, but we don't want 440. What do we want? What is it? Right. Uh, like this? Not quite. We need something else, right? Right. Right. It's a note number. It's just a, a number, you know, from 0 to 127. But if we plug that in, we're going to be providing a value that the synth is interpreting as a value in hertz. So it's going to be very, very low, right? Um, we'll do it just for fun. Right? Right? Those are just raw frequency values. Uh, but we don't want that. We want MIDI CPS. And now. polyphony, just like that. This is one of the beautiful things about the uh, Super Collider audio server is that um, I, heard, I heard it described recently on, on, um, on the forums as, you know, Super Collider produces notes on demand. You just make a synth, right? Synth, 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 just fire them off whenever you want, you have a note. And this is 
sort of uh, by comparison, not how programs like um, Max and Pure Data work, where sort of everything is live all the time, and you, you know, it's, uh, it's just kind of a different workflow. But this is great. We just have a system which just places synths at little private locations, and then when a node off comes, it releases them. And this this works um, this works pretty well. What we haven't done is incorporate velocity because right now I press this key really quietly, and it's loud. I mash it, same, right? Because we're not incorporating note velocity into the synth. But let's go ahead and do that. We have a parameter called amp. Um, so we can say amp. What do we put here? Yeah, uh, that's a good start, but just like this is a pretty bad idea because these velocity values called val range from 0 to 127. And that means we'd be dropping a value in here somewhere between 0 and 127. Uh, and a value of 2 makes the amplitude twice nominal. It's going to clip, and 127 is going to be like a right? Big explosion. So uh, to normalize these values, we can divide by 127. Right? So if the maximum velocity comes in, 127, this becomes a 1. And even this is probably a little too high, because if we play two notes with maximum velocity, they're both at an amplitude of 1. They're probably going to clip if they sum together. Yes? Do you ever have to do like an exponential curve or something like that? To... Yeah, we can certainly do that, actually. Maybe, maybe an even more, uh, yeah, this, this would be a linear mapping, right? Uh, which maybe doesn't feel quite so good. Uh, so but to, coming back to my, my previous thought here, we can just take this whole thing and scale it by some, you know, some, some factor which makes it so we can play multiple notes. And uh, this should now be kind of nice, right? So it's working, right? Let's see what uh, exponential would look like. What I would do is just say val.linexp and use our linear to exponential range mapping method. And the input range is 0 to 127. And the output range, we could do something like 0 0.02 to 0 0.2. And this will take this uh, linear input from 0 to 127 and map it onto the exponential curve from 0.02 to 0.2. This is um, something which is, uh, you just kind of have to play it under your fingers to really feel the difference here. But... And uh, if we play a sort of bunch of notes here, we can open up the meters. So dealing with levels which are good, right? Four notes, maximum velocity just comes up to, you know, minus 15, minus 10 or something like that. So that's, that's pretty good. And honestly, that's kind of it. I mean, <laughs> at this point, it's just whatever kinds of uh, decorative things you want to do. Uh, you know, like um, add a MIDI def dot CC, which is listening for some control change message to um, it might be a sustain pedal, might be a vibrato effect using a fader or the mod wheel or something like that, or doing pitch bend. Uh, and because we have this filter here, let's, let's actually do that. I'm going to use a knob to manipulate this filter. And here's where I'm going to do something using a different approach from all of my previous videos, because I think there's a better way. I've been kind of doing it in a suboptimal way this whole time. What I normally do is I will make a language side variable called like a cutoff frequency and, and I'll make a MIDI def.cc which updates this value and sets a bunch of synths. But there's an even nicer way and that is using buses. So tying into concepts from last week. And let me see if I can walk through it first in kind of like plain language here. Uh, we're going to make a MIDI def that listens for uh, control change messages from uh, this knob for example, the one that I'm turning right here. And it's going to map those values to an appropriate range and write them to a control bus. And then we're going to go up to our synth def, and instead of uh, using this argument, we're going to use in.kr and read from a control bus. And, uh, and that's, that's basically that's kind of it. And, and this is really nice because we can, uh, with, with audio buses, we can't directly write sample values to an audio bus from the language because it's running at the audio rate and it's just too precise and 
fast to be accessible. But control buses are different. We actually can just write values to a control bus from the language. We're going to do that. So the first step is we make a, a bus. We'll call it CF bus for a cutoff frequency bus. So on the local server, just one channel, because it's just one value. And there we go. We've made ourselves a little control bus to work with. And just for demonstration purposes, let's open up the scope. And let's look at this, this top line right here is uh, control bus 0. Okay? And what we can say is cfbus.value uh, 0 0.5. We can just set the value of this bus, right? 0 0.25, negative 0 0.25. We can even set it to 3,000, and it shoots off into the stratosphere, right? It's just a number. It's a number on a bus. And uh, we can also uh, say cfbus.get synchronous. And this returns the value from the bus. And this is really cool. This is, I, I have not been doing this nearly enough in my 12 years of using Super Collider. It's just the fact that you can just write to control buses and read from them just right there in the language without any fancy business. It's very, very handy. All right, so that's just talking to a bus here. What we're going to do is make a new MIDI def listening for control change messages. And uh, we're going to call this CF. Takes the usual four arguments. And for starters, let's just post everything. So I'm going to turn a knob. There we go. That's one knob. This is controller number 22. Values from 0 to 127. The one next to it, that's 23. This slider over here, controller number 71. So you see the channel is all the same, the source is all the same. We really only care about the controller value and the controller number. And so now we're just posting the value and the controller number. And once we have found a knob that we want to work with, I'm just going to use this knob right here, controller 22. The third argument of these various MIDI def objects is uh, it's going to vary based on the, um, the method. But here, it's a number or an array of numbers which represents the control change numbers that we want to listen to. And we only care about 22. So if we run this now, this knob is still working. But if I move any of the other knobs, I'm, I'm turning them furiously here. Nothing is doing anything, right? It's, it's just if any messages come in and they're not from controller 22, it just ignores them. Nothing happens. They don't pass through. So that, this is nice because we don't want every knob and every fader to change the cutoff frequency. We just want this one knob to do that job. So we're, we're essentially filtering the incoming MIDI messages. And we're just saying, we're checking the controller number. Is it 22? No? OK. We don't, we don't care. Get out of here. So now instead of posting, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, uh, val, no, sorry, cfbus.value, set that equal to um, this is going to be val.linexp0127, uh, and we're going to map this onto some appropriate range of cutoff frequencies. Let's say like 50 to 5,000. Right, that seems, seems reasonable. All right, so now if I run this, and if we look at our bus, and I'm going to move this fader, and it's working. I mean, it's, it's ranging from 50 to 5,000, so we, we can't really zoom out far enough to see it doing its thing. But just, just for clarity, if we change this to be something like this, so now this uh, output range that we can actually see, I turn this knob on the MIDI controller, and we're setting the bus value. But we don't want to send these values to our filter. We want appropriate values. Okay. So that's what we want. All right. Now we've got to go change our synth def. So we're going to get rid of this and just say cf, variable named cf. And it is going to be in.kr uh, cf 
uh, we'll call it CF, an argument called CF bus, uh, one channel. Okay? So CF is now a signal being read from a control bus. And when we create the synth in our note on MIDI def, we want to make sure that, is that it's called CF bus? Yeah, CF bus is going to be this bus that we've created, because that is the same bus that we are updating with our control change messages. And uh, now, I think, the moment of truth. We'll run this. I'll play a note. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's working. <laughs> uh, there you go. So. That, that's the, um, I, I really wish I had discovered this bus, bus approach a little bit earlier because it is quite clean. It's nice to just, when a value comes in, just dump it onto the server so that any synthesis process can access it. Like anything on the server can also take that value and do whatever they want with it. Uh, it's a little more complicated if you want to make, if you want to store the, uh, you know, the controller value or the cutoff frequency in the language because it involves Every time it changes, you have to pipe a bunch of values off to the server to set all the synths and update all these things. But with this approach, it just the value basically lives on the server, which is really convenient. All right, we're making great time. Before we move on to sending MIDI out, anyone have any questions about where we landed here? And from this, I hope you can kind of, you know, if you wanted to add a vibrato effect, you pick the mod wheel or pick a, you know, figure out what controller number it's on change the synth def, make a new MIDI def.cc, and you can weave that in. It's a good exercise, right, if you wanted to give that a try. You could download this lecture code and try to augment it with your own controller. Any questions? You're using in to grab the CF bus, right? I'm using in to grab the value on the bus. Okay. Yeah, it's a UGEN that reads a signal from a bus. In this case, a control signal. So it's reading from a control bus. And the MIDI def is the process that's responsible for writing data to that bus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about getting MIDI out. So we're going to just wipe all those, zero that bus. And so we, right, the controller is once again inactive, right? Not doing anything. To send MIDI out, of Super Collider, what you want to do is make an instance of an object called MIDI out. So this is the class that we use to identify a device, uh, a target basically, a destination for outgoing MIDI data, which is going to be generated in Super Collider. And there is a little bit of cross-platform business here. Uh, for Mac and Windows, what, I'm, what I do here is going to be pretty much what you need to do. Uh, slight, slight difference with Linux users. In addition to creating a MIDI out object, you also have to explicitly connect to it. But this is a step you don't have to do on Mac and Windows, I'm pretty sure. Is that a question? No, OK, just celebrating, right? <laughs> all right, uh, all right. so uh, in the past, I've done, uh, well, we can say um, MIDI client.destinations. And this gives us uh, an array of MIDI devices that are valid destinations. And again, it's just the same two objects. I could theoretically send data to this controller, but it wouldn't make any sound because it's a controller. It doesn't have any synthesis stuff. In it. So instead, what we're going to do is use this uh, IAC driver. So I'm going to write MIDI data to this driver, and then I'm going to use uh, Reaper to read that data and you know, play a synthesizer plugin. Right? And I, I could say uh, MIDI out.new zero, and that is going to attach to the zeroth item in this array of two things. But I, an even more, uh, a slightly more robust way is new by name. And then you can just copy the device name and port name right from the MIDI client.destinations printed output and paste them in here. Okay, 
And now we've created uh, a little object in SuperCollider that we can talk to in order to generate MIDI messages. And those are going to be sent to this IAC bus. So we could, for example, say m.note on. And we provide a channel, a note number, and a velocity. And we can also send a note off message with the same channel, same note number, and same release velocity. Nothing's going to happen yet. Don't get too excited. But by running those two lines, I'm basically spoofing me pressing down on that key and releasing it. Right? Anything listening is not going to be able to distinguish me running these two lines versus pressing a key and releasing a key on a controller. Right? Now, of course, we could just open up like Reaper or any DAW and just play directly on this controller. Right? That's the sort of normal, intuitive way. If you want to like play a melody, uh, it's a lot easier to just play piano keys than just do this. But what you can't do on a physical controller is programmatically, algorithmically generate a complex stream of MIDI data. Right? That's quite a bit harder to do. Anyway, so let's open up Reaper. I think I have a, uh, a patch ready to go, or a patch, whatever you call it, a session. Uh, so we're going to load this up. We're going to do a little split screen action here. And I've, I've done a lot of stuff in Reaper ahead of time just to kind of save time. But basically, the input of this track is, um, oh, it's somewhere. Let's see. Yeah, the input is all MIDI inputs, all channels. So this track is armed and uh, input monitoring. So it's, it's actively listening for any MIDI data that shows up. And I have the very basic resynth. Like, it's, it's just the world's simplest synth plugin. Right? It doesn't do anything too fancy, just for demonstration purposes. And uh, here we go. Right, here we go. We have sent MIDI from SuperCollider to the IAC bus, and that is one of the many things Reaper is actively listening to. Uh, so we can, uh, we can do something like this. But now we kind of have a problem. We, uh, we need to turn this off somehow, so we're going to do a little trick here. Uh, let's do, do that, just so we're not losing our minds here. Uh, I'm going to iterate over the numbers 0 through 127 and generate a note off message for each one. this. And that ought to do it, right? So for every number from 0 to 127, make a note off message like that. There we go. Right. Uh, it's the equivalent of like uh, all your keys on your keyboard are physically stuck down and you take a, a big large prying device and pop them all up. <laughs> right. So that's, uh, this is actually what you can do here is uh, store this in a function called like all off, like this, right? And then we can register this function with a class called command period. And what this does is it says, you know, whenever the user presses command period, in addition to all the normal stuff you usually do, also run this function. So command period now also pipes 128 different note off messages. So if we do this again and then press command period, everything should turn off. And then command period. Yeah, lovely. Normally it wouldn't do anything because the synthesis is happening over here in Reaper and command period has no effect on Reaper. Right? Okay, so then I guess what we'll do finally is come back to pbind and talk about a new type of event. Now, we, if you remember pbind, we've been primarily making note events, which uh, represent uh, the creation of a synth. A note event is basically make a synth, right, and provide a bunch of patterns. But there's another type of event called MIDI. And we'll start by just making one MIDI event. Uh, so we say type MIDI. Uh, uh, MIDI out, 
it needs to know its destination device. It needs to know what kind of message we're sending. So we'll say note on. And you can also provide the channel if that's relevant, but I don't care about that right now. Uh, MIDI note, we'll say 72. And sustain. You remember sustain from note events, which is a duration in beats uh, after which a corresponding gate zero message is sent. It's a way of automating the turning off of a synth that has an indefinite amplitude envelope. Same concept here. After sustain beats, a corresponding note off message will automatically be sent. So we'll just say two. And we could also say amp. And uh, this, this will, we, we, we use amp like we normally do in SuperCollider, zero to one. It will automatically get converted to the appropriate velocity value internally. There you go. So this is a slightly more elegant way of doing this. And I've got to turn this down quite a bit so we can turn that back up. And this is nice because we don't have to manually turn the note off. And so once we are comfortable with these events, we can make a p-bind. Let's just make something real quick. So type MIDI. Uh, let's just um, copy some of this stuff here. Uh, that's not what I want. And I'm not going to be very creative here. You'll forgive me, I, I hope. Uh, inf and uh, sustain. Let's make these all really short. And the doer values, um, p white. Let's do uh, p rand uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gripping, I know, right? It's really, yeah, it's a little bland, I know. But the concepts are there, right? This is, and so we, now the, the real great thing is you can just uh, just hit record, right? And this all just gets written to a track. So you can make all sorts of wacky sequences that are difficult, if not impossible, to generate with a physical controller and built-in DAW tools. And uh, you can just go get a cup of coffee, let this run. Come back and you've got a... <laughs> And then whenever you're done, just you know, stop the uh, stop the event stream player, and stop that, and we can save all that business, and here we go, right? Okay, and with time to spare, how about that for once? That is all I got for today. And I hope that gives you something to work with if you want to do MIDI stuff for your final project. As a reminder, I did post the final project prompt, so give it a read. Uh, all I want is a quick email from everybody in the next week, uh, I suppose, just giving me a rough idea of what you're planning to do. And um, there's some sort of ideas for inspiration in the prompt itself if you haven't read it already. So just let me know kind of what you're planning and if slash how I can help. Uh, next week, I think OSC is on the schedule. I might put that off and talk about graphical user interface design instead. So making windows and sliders and buttons and knobs and stuff like that. And um, so that'll be good. All right. Any any questions? No. All right. And all right. So I'll see you next week. Very good. <laughs>